Well, hello, hello everyone. Welcome to our virtual artist lecture with uh, Oakland-based artist Sadie Barnett. My name is Donna Gustafson. I'm the interim director of the Zimmerly Art Museum and curator of American art. I'd like to start tonight's program with an acknowledgement that Rutgers University is located on the ancestral lands of the still living, still sovereign Muncie Lenape people. We honor the Muncie Lenape and the many and diverse Native American indigenous peoples who call this region home, past, present and future. This program is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. Please type any questions you might have for Sadie in the Zoom Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen. We'll save all the questions for the end of the program. So tonight's lecture is part of an ongoing series of programs related to our upcoming exhibition, Angela Davis Sees the Time. It's scheduled to open at the Zimmerly in September of 2021. The exhibition was a collaborative project and I want to thank my co-curator, Jerry Began and Lisbeth Tellefson, whose archive inspired our deep dive into Angela Davis that led us to Sadie Barnett. Sadie's work will be included in Angela Davis Sees the Time. The event is supported in part by the National Endowment for the Arts and sponsored by the Department of Art and Design at Mason Gross School of the Arts. We would also like to thank Atif Akin and his design students, Annie Chang, Mila Klot, and Andrew Berger, for their work in designing the poster for the lecture, as well as Cassandra Oliveras Moreno for assistance in organizing this talk. And at the Zimmerly, I also wanna thank Austin Lasada and Nicole Simpson. So Sadie Barnett is from Oakland. She holds an BFA from Cal Arts and an MFA from the University of California, San Diego. Sadie's multidisciplinary practice includes drawing, photography, and large-scale installations, which often mine her family's history to uncover larger truths related to political, cultural, and social history. She has been awarded grants and residencies by the Studio Museum in Harlem, Art Adia, Art Matters, Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture, and the Headland Center for the Arts. Her work is in the permanent collections of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Berkeley Art Museum, the Oakland Museum of California, the Brooklyn Museum, and the Guggenheim in New York, among many others. In September of 2021, Barnett's work will be the subject of a solo exhibition at Benton Museum at Pomona College and Pitzer College Art Galleries in Pomona, California. That exhibition is titled Sadie Barnett, Legacy and Legend. We are delighted to have her here tonight to speak about her work. Please join me in now welcoming Sadie Barnett. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Donna, for that introduction. I hope everyone can see and hear me all right. Um, if not, I'm sure someone will shoot me a text. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you all for being here and joining us um, this evening or this afternoon, depending on where you are. I know that there is a lot going on today, um, a lot going on in our world. And if you're making space um, to kind of share in this conversation about art in this moment with me, I really appreciate that. And I also always wanna thank those that came before me. So before me on this land, before me in this profession, my ancestors and my family for always supporting me. Um, I also wanna thank the Zimmerly Museum for hosting this important exhibition, which I'm really excited to participate in as soon as we are able to open the exhibition. Um, and I also wanna thank Lisbeth um, Telfson, whose archive serves as the basis for this exhibition and who just really highlights how important um, the work of archiving and saving these histories is, which I deeply relate to. Um, and of course, I wanna thank Rutgers University, not only for having me for this talk, but also for the spirit of activism that is always coming out of this school. Um, congratulations on the recent divestment achievement. Um, and so basically, I'm gonna jump right into it. Um, I'm gonna share my screen.
And my hope, um, you know, my plan for the next 45 minutes, um, I'm going to try to keep it brief because hanging out on the computer screen can be really challenging, um, you know, to various of our senses. I'm just going to walk you through a few iterations of two different projects that really express themes and modalities that connect my wide ranging practice. So political and social structures are certainly a jumping off point for my work, but they're not the final destination. So I use abstraction, glitter, the fantastical to try and summon other dimensions of human experience and imagination and possibility. And I also always like to point out that, you know, talking about the work is never the work itself. Um, it's not the same as experiencing it. So I kind of hope that it, you know, points to the work, it circles around the work, it gets close to the work, but I always hope that there are some elements that you know, exist beyond language that really just can't be described or explained and that you have to feel them and experience them and see them, you know, for your own self with your own heart. Um, but I do hope that this talk will kind of serve as a welcome and an entry point into the work. Um, so the first project that I'm going to really delve into um, started with this exhibition of mine called Dear 1968, that um, the installation images that you'll see come from the San Diego Museum of Contemporary Art. And the exhibition also traveled to a few other university museums. And this exhibition draws from a intense and challenging history. It draws from a 500 page FBI surveillance file that was amassed on my father, Rodney Barnett, during his time with the Black Panthers in Southern California and during his time working with Angela Davis up here in the Bay Area. And we obtained this information by filing a Freedom of Information Act request as a family. It was 2011 when we started the process and it took almost five years to actually received the information. Um, and when we did, we were really blown away as a family by how intense, invasive, and terrifying the surveillance was, um, even in you know, what we received and knowing that there's more that we didn't receive. Um, so you know, my first reaction was, I have to turn this into artwork. I have to make this, information do something different than what it was meant to do, which was really to, you know, discredit, dismantle, unravel my father and the movement that him and so many young activists were building at that time. So I wanted to turn it into artwork and I'm gonna walk you through a few different ways that, that I did that and how it's an ongoing investigation and I'm continuing to iterate and continuing to develop a relationship with this material. Um, but, you know, I will definitely say that the first inkling, the first desire after receiving this chilling surveillance was how can I reclaim it? Um, and so what you're looking at here are two photographs that are small Polaroids scanned at a really high resolution and then blown up to almost life size. Um, on the left, you can see my father is in an army uniform. He's going to be drafted. He is drafted and he's going to be sent off to Vietnam. Um, the year is 1966. And in the next photograph, you can see he's in what we think of as the Panther uniform, you know, the leather jacket, the beret, um, the political buttons. And so to me, this is, this is one piece. It's a diptych that really talks about the kind of politicization and, um, you know, this process that happens after every war really in the history of our country where a generation of, at that time, you know, men of color come home and realize that although they've risked their lives, you know, potentially lost limbs, lost friends, although they've risked their lives, they haven't earned more rights and more respect 
in this country than before they left. And so often you'll see an upsurge of activism and folks demanding their rights and organizing after, um, you know, after they come home as vets. And so my dad talks about feeling like he was still at war after he came home because of the police presence in Compton, California, and that that was really the impetus for him to, you know, need to do something, some kind of activism. And the Panthers at the time was what made sense. And, you know, if you look at the 10 point platform of the Black Panthers, it's basically the same things that we are demanding today. Um, it's really nothing, you know, far out. It's, um, you know, the, the basic tenants that we are still fighting for today, as far as education, you know, dignity, housing, um, and also the Panthers always had a very international agenda and a systemic you know, view um, and thinking about things like capitalism. Um, so you can see the wallpaper in the background of this installation shot and here's a detail. Of course, the file is just very heavy with um, you know, officious markings, evidence of all of this bureaucratic labor. Um, the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover um, often referred to as COINTELPRO, which was his, you know, the wing that was um, spying on activists. Um, it's really a kind of weaponized bureaucracy. And so you can see how much um, labor goes into this. And you can see in the bottom left corner or in the top right, there's this racial int sect, which was the racial interest section. And so you can really see, um, you know, how systematized the racial profiling was. And so my first um, kind of intervention with the files, I was keeping them document size. So, you know, eight and a half by 11. I was marking them with spray paint, you know, pink, purple spray paint, sometimes rhinestones and glitter and trying to really interject my own language of redactions my own kind of, you know, tagging, thinking about my generation as like the 80s baby kind of tagging on these, you know, officious documents. Um, and also using the pink and the glitter to think about what would piss off J. Edgar Hoover the most, um, what would really be like a kryptonite to his important documents. I thought pink and glitter would really, would really be um, the kind of most, you know, egregious attack on these files. Um, so they're also mounted on pink flexi, so they get this kind of glow behind them. And, you know, I'm not going to do a huge history on J. Edgar Hoover because time is short, but I can say that he's quite, um, you know, sort of singular, unique figure in that he was the director of the FBI for almost 50 years, which is, you know, fairly unprecedented in a democracy to have someone in that position of power for so long. And there was almost no oversight um, over his actions, some of which I'll go into a little bit more in depth. Um, so here you can see is a, a detail of one of the pages. You know, the information on this page is small. It's just, um, you know, Rodney Barnett was observed embarking on American Airlines, flight 474 and the company of Angela Davis. This flight was en route from San Francisco to Chicago. But to me, some of these smaller you know, moments, there's not so much information on this page, but it has this visceral feeling, almost like a photograph and really capturing this moment of, you know, my father and Angela at the airport. Mind you, this is 11 days after she's been acquitted of all charges. There's no charges against my father, but still they're being followed, you know, in their daily activities. Um, and I think, you know, one thing to point out is that, you know, the idea of surveillance can sound quite passive, like it's just collecting of information. But what we find through going through the file is it's much more than that, you know, not just the file, but also studying cases in history. I mean, I think recently there's been, um, you know, a reactivation of talking about the murder of Fred Hampton, but it's, you know, it's intimidation, it's harassment, it's fomentation of personal disputes, it's provocateurs, it's coercion, and even assassination. Um, here's a, a mug shot, so to speak, um, of my father. You know, this was the only image in the entire dossier. And I wanted to see if, you know, by me drawing it, so this is a pencil drawing, 
here's a detail so you can really see um, the size of this is quite small. The full page is 20 by 30 inches, but the drawings is about four by six inches. And I drew it exactly as it appeared in the FBI file. So it had been copied and photocopied so many times that it gets this posterization kind of quality to it that almost looks like a political poster screen print. Um, and to me, you know, the very notion of a mugshot is really supposed to dehumanize someone, right? It's supposed to make them a number. It's supposed to make them dangerous and make them expendable. And, you know, that's really what this file represents in so many ways. So for me to try it and put some of the humanity back into this person, you know, my father, young man at the time, um, you know, through me drawing this, can it turn it into a portrait of a freedom fighter? Can it turn it into, you know, a, a love letter, a debt of gratitude from a daughter to a father? And this is a detail of the wallpaper that that image and a few others hang on. Um, this is like a re kind of oriented photograph of one of my little cousins sitting in what, you know, we often refer to as a Huey Newton chair, referencing this very symbolic iconic photograph of Huey P. Newton in one of these chairs holding a rifle and a spear. Um, but I am always interested in, you know, what are the moments besides those big iconic moments? What are the small everyday moments, you know, happening in the living room, happening with family? And undoubtedly there's, you know, little kids running around through all aspects of the movement. Um, and so I wanted to highlight that there's also this wand um, that's pinned to the wall and kind of trying to suggest, you know, a type of power that I might have as a young daughter, um, you know, that might in some magical way be able to, you know, retroactively protect um, or bring some healing and some repair. Um, maybe this wand, you know, makes someone um, invisible to the lens of state surveillance in a, you know, necessarily kind of failing attempt. Um, and then the last moment from this exhibition that I'll share are always, you know, I'm always pulling in these family moments. So this is a kind of salon style hang of collages that I've made from different, you know, family moments and our own personal family moments, um, always kind of giving them these otherworldly quality with these glitter fields that they, that the characters are kind of reverberating out of, or maybe, you know, traveling into and thinking about other possibilities, you know, what exists beyond where we are now and how can, and how can we ask for more? Um, so here's a, a detail of one of those. This is, um, you know, my contemporary dad, my nowadays dad um, pointing into this, you know, pink void, um, perhaps like suggesting another way of organizing our society, another way of being together um, and maybe, you know, leading the way, pointing, pointing, and, uh, and maybe we'll follow. Um, so this is a different exhibition, a different iteration of the FBI project. Um, I'm going to quickly walk you through it so you can see there's, again, a wallpaper, there's this bright, shining holographic couch, and there's a photograph of my auntie Viv that hangs above the above the couch and here's a photograph you can see you know she's lounging um, in her beautiful home space she was a talented seamstress and so she sewed the couch cushions and maybe parts of her outfit um, but you can really see there's like a great deal of care that's gone into her home place her you know, the aesthetics of her environment with the pictures, you know, on the end table, the shiny lamp, the painting above the couch. And so, you know, I kind of wanted to recreate that and thinking about the care and beauty that, you know, we achieved through our living room spaces for family, for a reflection of our identity, um, you know, for kind of making a space in the world for ourselves and for our, our family and love and care to unfold in. Um, However, always knowing that that's, you know, up against the realities of the world that we live in, and that even with this beautiful space, she is not able to escape the, you know, state surveillance. So even, 
you know, my, it wasn't just my father, it was all of his siblings, all of their spouses, the high school teacher, you know, um, from when my dad was young, little old lady next door to where he grew up, every, you know, employer that he'd ever had was interviewed, intimidated. Um, so across from the couch and the photograph of my Auntie Viv are these two FBI files. This time they're blown up quite um, a bit larger. So these are, I think, um, like again, four by six feet each page. And you can see in the top left-hand corner are these glittered surveillance cameras. So here's a detail of those cameras. Um, I use like a, basically like a car paint to get these glittering surfaces. And I was thinking about kind of, you know, restorative technology, potentially something that could inoculate, you know, and um, undo, you know, scramble the state surveillance with, you know, just some type of imagined uh, magic and force and potentiality. And you can see in these two pages, um, the page on the left is talking about informants and the page on the right is listing um, you know, party members, of course, all the names are blacked out. And so you just see male, Negro, Los Angeles, female, Negro. Um, and of course the redactions are already there, but what I did was just add this holographic vinyl material collage on top of the, holo on top of the redactions and really thinking again of a type of restorative technology and, you know, what type of restoration could come from these glitter fields kind of re-redacting, um, reinserting that, you know, you can't possibly know and understand these individuals um, simply by tailing and harassing them. And so this brings us to the work that I'm working on right now. Um, so these are large scale drawings, um, you know, as I continue to grapple with this, the weight of this surveillance and what it means and how it impacts, you know, not just my family, but so many families. Um, you know, I, I often say that I'm interested in telling my dad's story, not because it's so unique, but because it's actually um, quite, you know, communal, this is many family stories. Um, so many people were under surveillance at this time. So many black Americans were under surveillance that this is really a part of our collective, you know, family history and capital H history as well. So as I continue to work with this, um, you know, I'm finding that I wanted to scale up the work, um, both in terms of size and weight and material to really underscore that this is a project of restoration and reclamation. So here the file pages are tonally inverted, suggesting even further transmutation from the original source and intent. And they're re rendered in a heavy application of powdered graphite on stark white paper. Um, these drawings are 60 by 48 inches. So, you know, what I really, need you to do as you're sitting in front of your computer screen is imagine that these are much bigger. So imagine that you're at a big, beautiful museum, maybe you're with friends or family, and you're standing back looking up at these drawings that are taller than you. Um, and then I also need you to imagine the surface and texture of these drawings. So instead of looking at like a glowing, you know, LCD computer monitor, you have to imagine these drawings are really, they're kind of dark, they almost absorb light, but at the same time, they have a kind of metallic sheen to them. And there is a slight variation of where it's darker and lighter, there's some cloudiness. So they almost look like they're moving or maybe like they're alive or organic in some way. Um, another thing, that you would do if you were with them in real life um, is you would get up really close to the frame and try to see, you know, if they're really drawings or not, or, you know, where, how the edge of the graphite 
meets the edge of the paper. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through a few of the drawings and hopefully you can you know, kind of hold in your imagination that they're real objects. Um, so this particular drawing is called um, Axe to Handle. And you can see all of these different cities are listed up top. So San Francisco, Los Angeles, Boston, Washington, Cleveland, St. Louis, Baltimore, Cincinnati, um, you know, really, you can just see how many cities were involved, how much, you know, labor and manpower was going into this surveillance. Um, one thing that I learned is that at the time of COINTELPRO, every FBI agent was required to have at least one black informant. And actually in Washington, DC, FBI agents were required to have six black informants. And this wasn't just kind of like de facto office, you know, culture. This was an actual written decree to the point where if FBI agents were stationed somewhere where there weren't, you know, a significant black population, they had to actually fill out certain paperwork so that they wouldn't be met with a failure to perform for not having black informants. Um, so some of the things that I'll highlight very quickly from this page, it mentions that my father was a mail handler for the US Postal Service. And he was actually fired from his job. Um, we learned through the file because of his involvement in, in this activism, the FBI had him fired from his job at the post office and cited the reason of him living with a woman who he wasn't married to at the time, um, which was obviously just pretense um, but it really shows that, you know, this surveillance is much more intrusive than just collecting of information. It's taking away people's jobs and people's livelihoods. And another thing that you um, can see in this page is it mentions the ADEX list, which was a list of U.S. citizens who could be rounded up and detained without due process, which was completely unconstitutional. When J. Edgar Hoover was told it was unconstitutional, he simply changed the name and kept the practice going in secret. So here is a detail of the drawing. You can see that the roses themselves, which I'll talk a bit more about them, they have this smooth quality, whereas the information that comes from the FBI, um, you know, comes from the original documents that I received has this pixelated quality because I did receive the information digitally because it was 2015. Um, and I also really wanted to connect, you know, in a way, this surveillance to, you know, the really unfathomable amount of digital surveillance that's happening now. So here's uh, another, another one of the drawings. You can see the stamp on this one at the top says Black Panther Party racial matters. Um, and I wanted to quote briefly something that Betty Medsker writes, who I'll explain a bit about who she is as well. But she says, the overall impression in directives written by Hoover, other headquarter officials, and local FBI officials was that the FBI thought of Black Americans as falling into two categories, Black people who should be spied on by the FBI, and Black people who should spy on other Black people for the FBI. So, you know, this category of racial matters just really shows how systematized um, and institutionalized the racial profiling was. And, you know, I mentioned Betty Medsker. I just want to quickly mention that this month is the 50th anniversary of this fascinating and inspiring case of um, when in 1971, eight young activists in Media, Pennsylvania broke into an FBI office um, and secured documents, which they then sent to the media, most of whom simply sent the documents back to the FBI. But Betty Medsker was brave enough to publish the information that they found, which is basically how we found out about the existence of COINTELPRO and how there started to be some small, you know, um, steps towards oversight over the FBI. Um, before that, really nobody was able to touch J. Edgar Hoover and nobody knew what he was up to. And those eight activists, you know, who were college professors, um, parents, 
activists, anti-war activists, regular people, you know, really um, took a huge risk because they knew that this surveillance was so intense that they would never really be able to know, you know, what their own government was doing unless they took these matters. So Betty Metzger has an amazing book called The Burglary, all about this case. And I believe there's also a Netflix documentary called 1971. So I'm going to keep moving, um, you know, in the interest of time, but I will, I'll mention, you know, where the roses come from. Um, that's a recent addition with these drawings. And I really wanted to think of, you know, again, how can I insert myself and my family and these priorities and this, you know, love and care that I'm kind of waging against these documents? How can I insert that into this story, into this narrative, but also letting, you know, the archival material speak for itself? And so I found that drawing these roses was really a way to honor, to mourn, to memorialize, um, to add life and to suggest evidence of the domestic and rituals of care. So in this particular page, the flowers are kind of growing out of this, you know, text saying former members and really thinking about, you know, everything that the former members have been dealing with and continue to deal with. Um, you know, I think public opinion about the Black Panthers has changed a lot, you know, in the last decade or so, but there hasn't been actual repair. You know, Mumia Abu Jamal is still incarcerated, even as we celebrate, you know, the 50th anniversary. He's incarcerated, and even, you know, someone like him who has a large profile and who people have been organizing um, to try and protect for years you know, still remains incarcerated as are many other activists um, and many other families who lost loved ones um, at that time. So I think, you know, these roses and these drawings are really um, kind of me meditating or almost, you know, casting spells for healing, for justice, um, and really, you know, just an evidence of the love that I'm trying to again, wage, you know, in, in, um, in an effort to kind of, in some small, tiny way, um, at least know that I'm engaging in this process of, of repair. And here's again, um, a detail. And I also, you know, I want to mention that it wasn't just the Black Panthers who, you know, might be known for being more outspoken or militant that were under surveillance. Um, even the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was under surveillance. The NAACP had been under FBI surveillance since 1923. Um, this is one of the most recent drawings that I've done. Um, and you, know, you can see there's a lot of detail and really laborious you know, work that goes into making these, which I think is also a kind of a part of this meditation of spending time with this material and thinking about, you know, um, my interest in this moment is really not, you know, hypothetical or just aesthetic. There's really so much at stake and so much of what the work of the, that the Panthers were doing was about family, you know, and about caring for um, ourselves and each other when our government was not. Um, you know, whether it was the free ambulance program or the free breakfast program or protecting people from getting evicted. Um, so much of it can really be thought of as like a family, um, a project about family. Um, and J. Edgar Hoover did famously say that the most dangerous aspect of the Black Panthers was the free breakfast program. Uh, I think there's a a detail of the way that the text is interacting with the flowers in this particular drawing. Um, so as you know, mentioned in the beginning, I'm working on these drawings for an exhibition that will be at the Pomona and Pitzer colleges. It's like a two-part exhibition um, called Legend and Legacy. And there will also be a book that accompanies that. So I'm, I'm really um, excited to be able to share this work in that way. And I'm hoping to have about 12 of these drawings in that exhibition, you know, all in a room together. Um, and I'll be excited to share that work um, as soon as it comes together. 
Um, so this, this particular page is actually the FBI is passing around editions of the Black Panther newspaper, which um, was a really big part of the Panthers organizing, you know, both to spread news and community events and also the artwork of Emory Douglas that was on most of, you know, throughout most of the newspapers was really, um, you know, realizing the power of aesthetics and image making and, you know, inspiring and galvanizing the community. Um, and of course the FBI also knew that this was very, um, you know, uh, important aspect of the of the Panthers. And so they would also collect the paper and would basically, you know, look through the paper to try to find images of people to surveil. Um, and for this page, I, you know, drew all these Hello Kitties, again, trying to kind of bring in, you know, my voice as this daughter. Um, and I felt like that Hello Kitties almost became like, you know, this little army of Hello Kitties, um, you know, that were like maybe organizing as well. Um, and I also have an obsession with Hello Kitty. Sometime at a later date, I will share more about that with you. And here's a, a detail again. You know, another thing that I learned um, recently actually was that Paul Coates, the father of ta Coates, was also under surveillance simply for owning and operating a bookstore selling Black literature. Um, so, you know, again, it's like, what's more dangerous than knowledge? Um, maybe perhaps like the free breakfast program. And so in the next like, you know, few minutes, I just wanna walk you guys through another project that is different but interrelated because I think putting these two projects next to each other, um, you know, really shows you kind of the breadth of my work and also the breadth of my father and, you know, the breadth of our communities and our histories and how expansive they really are. So this project is the new Eagle Creek Saloon. And the Eagle Creek Saloon was a bar that my father owned in the 90s. It was the first black owned gay bar in San Francisco. And my father opened this bar, you know, not because he had always had the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial dream of owning a bar, but because of the racism that him and his friends experienced at the you know, predominantly white gay bars in San Francisco at that time. Um, there, you know, are well-documented cases of, you know, the discrimination from asking people of color for three forms of ID at the door to policing dress code and people's dancing. Um, and so basically, you know, something that was supposed to be, you know, the gay Mecca of San Francisco and going out and being in community together was actually, you know, for many people of color and for interracial couples was actually a degrading you know, experience. And so my father set up this bar with the help of, you know, friends and family. And in 2019, I decided to basically make a bar to honor my father's bar. And instead of making a project that was, you know, photographs on a wall, I knew I needed to make a project that was literally a bar and that was alive and that was active as it honored my father's bar. And so that's what I did. Um, so you can see here, it's like this U-shaped sculpture slash monument slash bar slash altar. Um, it's got you know 12 stools. It's got a bunch of glitter objects on that back rack. And of course, a neon sign to really draw people into the welcoming glow of this space. Um, here's a detail of one of the sides of the bar, again, like utilizing those glitter objects. And on top of the bar, there were images of, you know, patrons past from, from my dad's bar, many of whom were also able to join in my revival, which made it a really intergenerational, rich, warm space where it was my friends and my dad's friends hanging out um, in this really, you know, kind of freeing um, moment, I feel like oftentimes in queer spaces, we don't necessarily have multi-generational 
um, hangs going on. So that was really important. Here's a detail of the bar, also showing um, my father. It's my father on the very right, putting up the bunny ears. Um, and then on the far left are two of his brothers, my uncle Alvin and my uncle Carl, who did a ton of work at the bar, um, you know, making it really beautiful. They redid, you know, a bunch of the interior and really, um, you know, my dad said, it, it's gonna be the only black owned gay bar. It has to be beautiful and everything legit and on the level. Um, here's another detail of the bar and sort of one of the mascots of the bar. Um, this is Sammy who I didn't get to meet, but who, um, you know, I am really paying tribute to with this project. Um, I'm gonna play you this time-lapse video um, because I think it will really express how it went from like a sculpture and an object to actually becoming a place. So, you know, really you can see that it's, this project is all about the people who come to it. Um, I had a bartender, this is my friend Redwood Hill, who is an artist as well as a bartender and really embodied, you know, the kind of performance of, you know, back in being behind the bar and the exchange that you have. Um, I was able to invite Rashad Pridgen, um, who's an amazing performer in the Bay Area and beyond to really, um, you know, take over the bar for an evening um, in really what was, I can only describe as like a dance ritual. Um, there was a zine that went along with it, which, you know, I really hope can be dispersed and travel to places that, you know, I can't go to and that the bar can't go to, but that someday, you know, maybe someone's looking at, you know, someone's coffee table finds the zine and is like, oh, I was there as well. Um, and, you know, I can continue to collect stories about the Eagle Creek because it's really not um, known. It's not well documented. You know, um, as soon as I told people that I was working on this project, they would say, oh, we have to go to this archive or, you know, that archive. Maybe there'll be some information. But the sad truth was that, you know, this bar isn't in the archives and not everything that, you know, has happened in our amazing history is documented. And so I felt like, well, if we're not in the archives, I need to make an archive. And that's really what this project has been about. Um, and in the last couple minutes, I can show you um, one of the really kind of monumental moments in the, his in the project of the Eagle Creek Saloon was when we took the whole bar, put it on a flatbed truck, and took it to San Francisco Pride in 2019. Um, this is also just mirroring something that my father's patrons of the bar, you know, kind of demanded like, Rodney, we, we gotta have a float, you know, in Pride, like we have this amazing multiracial community. And when we look at San Francisco Pride, it doesn't really look like us, you know, we need to show out um, and show up. And they did just that. So um, I put like, every actual object to really preserve the sculptural integrity of the thing. And then we drove it through pride and basically everyone that had been hanging out throughout the his, you know, the run of the exhibition, which the first exhibition was at the lab in San Francisco, an amazing experimental art space that really allowed the project to kind of grow and flourish and be free and, you know, changeable. Um, everybody who had been hanging out at the lab with the Eagle Creek all summer, you know, came together and danced in the street and danced on the float. And we just had such an amazing, um, an amazing time. And you can see in this photo um, in the back of the float with the tambourine is December, one of the original, you know, um, patrons and members, community members of the bar. So again, this, you know, really intergenerational um, you know, 
long arc, long legacy of community was represented. Here we are having fun. Um, there was also like an eight month old baby on the float. So when I say intergenerational, I really mean a wide, wide range. Um, this is my father on the mic and behind him um, is Jamal Bates, representative of the Black Aesthetic Collective who also did an amazing film screening um, at the bar. And then the Eagle Creek traveled down to Los Angeles to um, the Institute of Contemporary Art in LA. And um, I'm really hoping that this project can continue to travel obviously because of you know, COVID, we haven't been able to do this project that is so much about being together in real life, in real time, in real space. Um, but I'm hoping that once things open up, we'll be able to, you know, bring the bar to a city near you. Um, and you can follow along, you know, hopefully on this journey. Um, you can follow my Instagram or, you know, sign up for my mailing list on my website and see how these projects continue to grow. Um, because one of the things that I've learned, you know, throughout both of these projects is that it's always iterative. I'm always learning more and new things from the archival material itself and from the way that people engage, you know, with the work. And so it's always um, growing and teaching me. And I hope to continue to be in conversation um, with with y'all as, as that develops. So thank you again for your attention on this computer screen. Um, I believe we're gonna open it up for questions. So I will welcome y'all, welcome y'all back to do that. So thanks so much, Sadie. I'm sort of the disembodied voice that's going to give you the questions. Uh, we actually had a of amazing questions come in, but I want to first start with a comment that someone left from an anonymous attendee. They said, hi, Sadie, thanks so much for coming to speak with us. Not a question, but I wanted to let you know that I was lucky to be living in San Francisco when the new Eagle Creek Saloon was at the lab. That work had such a great impact on the community, and it was such a nice reminder of what queer culture in San Francisco can be like. Thank you. So just wanted to start off by saying that and to move to some other questions. Um, Shakira, uh, I'm just going to start. I'm going to say first names just so I don't, uh, you know, mess anything up. But Shakira asks, hi, Sadie. I love the amount of history that you share with your arts. Did you conduct any archival research to accompany the FBI files? Thank you for sharing your work with us. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I definitely think of myself as an artist first. I think some artists, you know, their process are always very research based. Um, but to me, it wasn't that I went out looking for this information or this archive. It just sort of walked into my life and demanded, you know, my attention. So of course, you know, just being curious, I have delved into doing, you know, a lot of research about the FBI and about surveillance and, um, you know, like I mentioned, I think that Betty Medsker book is an amazing resource, um, The Burglary. Um, also, you know, Simone Brown um, is a thinker and writer who, you know, continues to be teaching me different ways of kind of situating surveillance, you know, going as far back as enslavement and thinking about, you know, digital, um, you know, surveillance today. And her book is Dark Matters. So yeah, I've definitely, you know, done a lot, done a lot of research just to kind of, um, you know, anchor the work, um, even though my, you know, my process didn't, um, I didn't think that that would be how, you know, my practice would develop, but sometimes you just kind of have to listen to, listen to what stories come your way. Thank you for that. So a question from Joshua, he says, um, they say, I'm curious about your thought process of spatiality with your exhibitions. What leads you to choose a wall piece versus a whole room with interactive pieces such as a couch? What are your thoughts during creation regarding how the audience receives your work? Hmm. Yeah, well, I think, you know, the exciting thing about objects and space is like once you kind of come off the wall 
everything in the space is kind of implicated. And so depending on how much control, you know, I have over any given exhibition space, I think that often kind of determines how, you know, how I want to use the space. Um, but again, I think it's often just really listening to the work, like with the FBI files, it just seemed like, okay, they need to get bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, you need to kind of I want to confront people on like a human scale with, with each of these pages being almost like, you know, a portal or um, something that you're, you know, kind of confronted with and almost entering into. Um, where And then the couches, you know, it just seemed like, um, you know, such a kind of perfect symbol for family and for, you know, this, Thing that I'm always talking about the living room space of where so much of this history is unfolding you know the couch is like the perfect embodiment of that living room space which to me is so important to have alongside of these kind of like big you know political moments or histories that I'm dealing with it's always still about you know people and individual families and joking and laughing and dancing in the living room you know um, after a hard day or during challenging different, you know, difficult political moments, holding space for each other um, in, in those home spaces. So Evie asks, um, uh, first she says, what a uh, wonderful introduction to your art this has been. Um, her question is about how you're thinking about gender in your practice. The use of the color pink, glitter, roses, and the Hello Kitty icon will call up a particular construction of girlhood for many of us. Could you talk more about how you're thinking about gender, your own as a daughter rather than a son, your father's uh, as a gay man in relation to the various conceptions of blackness you're also engaging? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you for these questions. You know, it's a bit of like disembodied because um, I can't see you guys, but um, I appreciate, you know, that you guys are here and that we're still managing to have a dialogue. Um, this is a great question. I think, you know, the way that I'm thinking of gender, I will say first and foremost is expansively, right? So I definitely use, you know, this, pink and it's a very particular pink. I like to use like a, I think of it as like a plasticky pink, like a Barbie pink, um, a kind of synthetic pink. Like you could almost smell the like toy plastic smell that goes along with this pink. It's not like an organic pink, um, a lot of glitter and rhinestones. And you know, the way I really think about it is like, as like a high femme sort of um, aesthetic, a language, a power that I have found um, a lot of strength in, you know, this way that people adorn themselves and use, you know, these bright colors and flashy gold jewelry to kind of let you know that, you know, I'm here and to let you know, like, I exist in this world and I take up space and I take up visual space and I'm important. Um, however, I think of, you know, and the reason why I call it like a high femme kind of you know, language or exchange or aesthetic is because I think it can exist, you know, much broader than our like binary ways of looking at gender. So people of all genders, you know, um, use and employ and engage in this um, powerful aesthetic. And so that's really, you know, how I use it and how I hope that it um, can be open enough to grow and expand with our ever evolving definitions of blackness and of gender and of sexuality um, and of identity because you know as we know the way that we've you know been equipped to deal with to talk about these things and the systems that have forced us to live in such you know um, limited areas of our fullest selves you know based on these um, based on these categories you know obviously isn't um, enough and doesn't begin to, you know, um, make space for all of the magic that we inhabit. But I, you know, do see a lot of um, change and development in some of those languages. And so that, that gives me hope for a more expansive future, you know, where I think people 
like my father and like me would, um, you know, be able to inhabit um, just like as as the norm because we're kind of um, already, you know, living in the future. So just just two more questions, Sadie. One that is really intriguing to me too. After looking at your drawings, an anonymous attendee ask, how do you make the large drawings with powdered graphite? And to add on to that question, how do you apply powdered graphite? I've never even thought about that. Um, yeah, so it's, um, it's, a, it's a process. It's interesting because, um, so essentially, you know, powdered graphite, it's, it is used in art sometimes, and it's often used as like a lubricant for, um, you know, like if your lock gets stuck or something like that. Um, but it can be used in art. Also, some people mix it with water. I use it just as like a powdered form. I actually put it in a salt shaker um, and then like shake it out onto the paper and really rub it in to the paper. But before any of that happens, I'm basically making like a really elaborate stencil. Um, so everything that you see in the image, and I can like go back to a drawing, everything that you see in the image exists in a stencil first. So it's created on a computer and then the stencil is applied to the paper and actually making the stencil is kind of the most laborious part of it. And then, you know, putting the powdered graphite on top of the stencil and working it into the paper um, is more of like a bigger, you know, full body gesture, um, probably feels a bit more painterly in a way. Um, and then there's the process of peeling up the stencil, which is again, like one of the really slower parts. Um, and yeah, that's basically how, how I make it. And some of the newer drawings, I'm even experimenting with a little bit of um, color and spray paint on the drawings, but I think one of the reasons that I'm, you know, really drawn to graphite is that um, it's sort of drawerly, but at the same time, it's kind of a commercial, um, you know, material, and so it doesn't necessarily feel super precious. And it has again this like metallic quality to it um, once it's worked onto the paper. I think that I think that answered. That I don't know definitely if that, I answered that the second part. Okay. Yeah. So um, one last question here from Mark. He asks, uh, Sadie, do you believe the amount of surveillance today is excessive? Bradley Beach using drones to enforce social distancing at the oceanfront and Los Angeles using Google data to watch population movements to see spikes in the virus. Um, is this government watching us for whose benefit? Also, your work is amazing. Um, well, the short answer is yes, <laughs> um, absolutely. Um, I always hope, you know, that by doing this project and doing this work that people will be able to connect it to today. And obviously, you know, that question um, shows, you know, a knowledge of, you know, some of the many types of surveillance that are going on today, um, you know, and 500 pages kind of sounds like a lot, but at the same time, I think about, you know, the surveillance that's being collected now is just like massive, you know, it would be just every digital communication that you've, you know, ever had. And so often nowadays we're kind of trained to surveil ourselves. You know, we give our thumbprint to the phone. We're always checking in, you know, where we are and giving away our location. Um, something that, you know, came out in about 2017 that was really, um, you know, quite stunning, although not shocking, was this new FBI category that was being used to target Black Lives Matter activists and organizers, and also just folks who were showing up for protests. And that um, category was Black identity extremists, um, which is really like, you know, it's essentially like a hallucination of the FBI about what they think black protest is about, right? And this is the same thing that we see going all the way back, um, you know, as far back as you wanna go is that there's this conflation of black organizing and activism has to do with violence and has to do with like, you know, 
some type of um, revenge possibly, even though, you know, something that's astonishing to me is that our movements have never been seeking revenge. They've simply been seeking justice, right? Like, you know, Mr. Sharpton said it, like all we want is the knee off our neck, right? Um, all that we've been asking for is just to be left alone, if nothing else, um, as we try to support and take care of our communities. Um, but yet there's this hallucination from, you know, the FBI in this case, that there are black identity extremists, um, you know, when we clearly see that quite the opposite was the threat all along. Um, so I definitely connect this work to activists who are working today. Um, I try to, you know, connect and share whatever information I can and also, you know, hear their stories and hope that people are being protected in whatever, um, in whatever ways they can, you know, as this work obviously continues. That concludes the questions. Thank you so much, Sadie. That was so wonderful and thoughtful. And uh, thank you for taking the time to talk with us all today. And uh, thank you everyone for sending those questions. And thank you again, Sadie, for your answers and everything. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. All right, goodbye everyone.